وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على انبياء اجمعين والمسيح والمحتي والمجدد لما المرسلين are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it and that he is alone and has no part and that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sustainer of all the boundless universes all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the generous eternal friend and send salutations of Allah on all of his prophets and his apostles and on the Messiah the anointed one and on the Mahdi the guide and on the Mujaddid the reformer which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and now the true light featuring as sayyid al imam isa al hadi al mahdi how long was satan being a boundless pit now in 20 it says <clears throat> And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now what starts to happen? Judgment is going to start. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. This goes back to Revelation 12, 9 again, as I told you, after the devil was cast to earth. Now he's getting bound a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years is up. That thousand year period is while the 144,000 will be up in the mothership being groomed, which is mentioned in Revelation 21. You just went through the calamities and all the wars that are starting right now, which is mentioned in Matthew 24, rumors of wars, nation against nation, pestilence, earthquakes, famine, disease. That's what we just went through as it falls. But the hosts are looking down from heaven in the beginning of 20, looking down at earth and seeing these calamities. They're not in it. Now it tells you where they are. Now watch. Number four. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Jesus' true disciples who were persecuted for spreading his gospel. He saw that they made heaven beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of Allah and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years that means that his disciples will be also with the 144,000 those that did not succumb to the weakness of the Roman Empire like Paul and them did. Number five, but the rest of the dead live not again till a thousand years are finished. Nobody else will be a part of that resurrection until that thousand years is up. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. What is the second death? The second death is, once a man dies, then he goes into judgment. The determination of whether or not he will gain everlasting life or die again and go into eternal damnation is on his soul. Once a man to die and then he goes. Once you die, either you will raise into everlasting life or you will be condemned to the second death, to eternal damnation. The choice is on you, it says here. Number six of 20 of Revelations. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of Allah and of the Messiah. That means Jesus. They'll be his priests. And shall reign with him how long? One thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Sijin, they call it in the Quran and shall go out to deceive the nations which are what? In the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. They just had their meeting this week. I told you to expect it. 
they came together this week. I told you all that last year would happen. All right? Gog and Magog is atheists and non-atheists. Gather them together to battle. The number, and they're getting ready to battle. They got Afghanistan, they got Persian Gulf, they got, they are prepared, you see. You live to see it. The number of whom are as the sands of the seas. The third world power is going to come in and help the United States and Russia. Those are the kings of the east that must come across the Euphrates, which is mentioned also in Ezekiel. And they went up on the edge of the earth and encircled the camp of the saints all about. And the beloved city, that is the new city of Zion, new city of Jerusalem, the tabernacle. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them, he deceived his own people, his own followers. All those black people that have fallen to false Christ are going to be deceived by him too. The devil that deceived them did what? Was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, which is that one who calls himself Jesus, the one you all are worshiping who's really bar Jesus, are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's judgment. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Allah. And the books, plural, kutub, the books were open. Everybody's deeds are going to start. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. First of all, every man's book. That's why a Muslim turns his face to the right in prayer and says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And then he turns his face to the left and says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He's greeting the two angels that keeps his records. On that day, your book of records will be opened, and then the book of life. What is the book of life? Let's see. It says, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. They talk about the heavens opening like the Quran says, and the angels coming down are like the judgment starting. And there was found no place for them. There will be no hiding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yam akhri. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Allah, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Not which was written in the book. The dead are going to be judged by their works. They don't ask you if my grandmother died before she became a Muslim, but she's a good person, will she make heaven? The Bible says that she's going to be judged out of her works according to her what? Out of her book of deeds, how does she live from day to day according to her works? She cannot be judged by Deen al Islam, Mila Ibrahim. So don't fear for her, fear for yourself, because you know the truth. Now, number 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Remember, Quran says, everyone will taste hell, then you will return to Allah. You will all taste it. You will feel the pains of hell through your judgment. And they will judge every man according to what? Their works. Their works. And death and hell will cast into a lake and fire. This is the second death. See? After that judgment is over, then that's cast away too. There'll be no more. This is the final, the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book, in the book of life, <laughs> was cast in. So your deeds was pulled out but a book of those who were in the tabernacle, who entered back into the garden, as it says, because that's the tree. Now watch, 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from Allah out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for husband. Like I explained back in 19. That's the wedding of the Lamb. And you women will have to be prepared as brides adorned for that meeting. 
Are you wearing your long white veil? Are you in a state of purity? The Western world acknowledges the dress of a bride as a long white dress and a face veil, even if she's a Christian. And the Bible picks it up to be ready for it. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Allah is with men. <laughs> is now with us on earth. What did Jesus say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. This is what he just said in Revelation chapter 21. What did he just say? Chapter 21, 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Allah is with man. The kingdom has come down to earth. And he shall dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And Allah himself shall be with them. And they shall be what? And shall be their creator. In the Holy Quran it tells us this is to expect this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Allah shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Because remember, death is sin. The fear of death is sin. There will be no more dying, nothing but eternal life. Which you originally had in the garden until you partook of the fruit of which you were forbidden to eat. Of which you would have received if you would have received Jesus the Messiah, but you didn't. You would have regained eternal life again, but you didn't. You turned away from him and worshipped everything but him. Turned him into a god, turned him into the god. First it was a god, then he became the god. I'm going to show you exactly where in the scripture they pulled that trick on you in a little while. Where was that? Well, you're four. finishing four. You're four, okay. Neither sorrow you have to. Let me start at four again. For Allah shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. All those physical things will be gone. The transformation is taking place from mortal to immortality. From beings to supreme beings. This is what he's saying. Number five. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, what? I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. John, write these things down, because this is going to happen. And that's why he got this book. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the first and the last. I was here in the beginning, and I am here at the end. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountains of the water of life freely. We call it Kothar in the Quran. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his creator, and he shall be my son. That's what Jesus said. As many as believe on me, them too, I give the power to become the sons of God. You see? You're going to end up a son of God anyway, if you have faith. But the fearful, now let's talk about those other people. But the fearful, those people who are afraid to make that first step, I'm coming home one day, I'm getting together. The fearful, the unbelieving, those who conceal the truth, knowing, because these were cast the rule here, they hide what they really are. And the abominable, and the murderers, and the warmongers, and those sorcerers like that bar of Jesus, and idol worshippers like the Catholics who got statues all over the church and then say they're not worshipable. And a lot of Muslims are now idol worshippers because they're now worshipping Muhammad and his Sahaba and the Khulufa. They're worshipping. They're not respecting. It's a difference. To become an idol worshipper is not even intending to because of the spread of false Islam by the hypocrites which is referred to in the Quran as Al Arab, the fake Arabs. Idolers and liars. It tells you the Quran about those who lie about the deen. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is what? That is the second death. They're going to go there eternally with him. And there came unto me one 
of the seven angels, that means of the seven archangels, which had the seven vows, full of the seven last plagues, the seven last plagues, and talk with me saying, come up, come up to the ship, come up, come hither. I shall show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. He's going to take John into the mothership and show John the mothership, the new city, the crystal city, the Bible calls it. He says, come on up here, I want to show you something. I'm going to show you Jesus' wife because people were looking for something else. Number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit, took me out of my body, to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending, coming down out of heaven from Allah. That's what your Close Encounter movie is about. The so-called Close Encounter UFOs, they try to make it out of a myth. They're talking about another abode descending, where two abodes mixed together, the earthly abode and the heavenly abode. Malakut and Nasut merging into one. Number 11, having the glory of Allah and her light was like unto the stone most precious. It will go on and describe to you the city, the length, the breadth, and everything about it, which I won't go into in this book. Then it goes on in 27 of the same 21, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, that defiles. If you are pork eating, alcohol drinking, cigarettes smoking, if you're defiled, you will not enter into the city. So don't let nobody tell you you can do it and live in sin because you're not. Neither whatsoever worketh abominations or maketh the lie, but they which are written in the what? Lamb's book of life. Those are the only ones getting in there. Your name is in that book. If not, you're not getting in. And if we went on to 22 of Revelation, which is kind of difficult because my voice is going, I'm tired. It would get even more explicit about the end of the world. Now, what I was telling you about is how they made the name, the blasphemous name of Jesus. Now, you say, what? The blasphemous name of Jesus? Yes. Turn to... The book of Luke, 427. They're going to take and change the name of Elijah, and they're going to add the name Zeus in it. Right in the Bible. Go ahead. And many lepers were in Israel in that time of Elijah. Many lepers lived in, in Israel at the time of Elijah, which is another name for Elijah. The prophet. And none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman and Syrian. And, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Do you see the name? Now go back to 25 and watch the name. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of, Eli who's that? Eli Elias. You see that name, Elias? Mm -hmm. When the heavens were shut up three years, and six months when great famines was throughout all the lands. Now they're going to take the same name and change it. But unto none of them was Elias sent save unto Sophapha, the city of Sidon, which was leopards, of course, they were Canaanites. Unto a woman that was a widow. Now, and many leopards were in Israel in the time of, you know that they've added Zeus now? S-E-U-S, mm -hmm. Eli, and then Zeus. Right. The same way they did with Jah and Zeus and came up with Jesus. These are the blasphemous names they're using. Rather than to use his name, Yeshua, or Isa, or Elijah, they've changed the name and added a Greek god Zeus right in the Bible, right in front of you. Can you see it? Yeah. That's frightening that they've played these many games. But I guess it's not important because this guy, Luke, wasn't really one of Jesus' disciples anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. I wanted to know what the word quibla means. It's spelled here Q I B L A H. The word Qibla. 
has the word acceptance in it, which is the accepted direction. Okay? Okay. Um, well, I was looking at 143 and 44 in the first, is it the second surah? The first part. Second. Second, second surah. And can you tell me what this means? And the question is stemming from which part? It's standing, well, what I, I guess what I'm asking is, I thought Quibla was a way of life or... Oh, no. Okay, this section of the Holy Quran, it starts off by saying there are certain people who are fools. They use the word in there, Tasfa'aha. Right? They are mm -hmm. fools, men and nas, from the people. Mm -hmm. And these people, what do they say about them? They will say to you, they're speaking to Muhammad, what is it, Muhammad? Not who is it now, but what is it, Muhammad, that have made you change your face from facing the Masjid in Aqsa, Aqsa of Jerusalem, to Mecca? You see, because they didn't believe that Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam, Muhammad, was receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the so-called Jew of his time, which were not the originals, but the so-called Jews in Medina of Muhammad's time, opposed him, though their elders, the Quran says, knew that he was the uh, Ahmed mentioned in their scripture, right? So they asked him, what is it? And notice the law calls them fools. <laughs> They'll ask you, what has turned you from their Qibla? Their Qibla was Jerusalem. Say, to Allah belongs the east and the west. They were speaking from Mecca, so they were pointing westwardly and eastwardly. You see what I'm saying? Most Muslims translate this to mean everything, be it east or west, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for salah. Therefore, you can pray in any direction. No. If you were in China, you'd be facing west. If you were in India, you'd be facing north. And if you were in Jordan, you'd be facing south. And if you was in the right place, the west, you'd be facing the east. You follow? Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was showing his divinity by this quote that he does not look from a horizontal standpoint of view but rather from a vertical standpoint of view. He looks at the world from all sides, not from the world in one direction or the other. So they told Rasulullah that the east and the west belongs to the Lord. That's the same thing as if I started at a masjid with my feet towards the Qibla, the Muslim would say, it's not sunnah for a Muslim to sit there with his feet facing the Qibla. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I would say, why? And they'd say, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in that direction. And I'd say, well, please, face my feet in some direction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't. So I'll know where to build my bathroom. And they would laugh and say, this is impossible, because there's no direction you can turn where Allah isn't. Then I'd say, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's exactly what he was talking about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a direction. But he has given me and you a direction, and the direction that he has given me and you is a certain place and a certain object. Why did he give us an object, the Kaaba? Because the Kaaba is a square, 40 by 40. Make note that the Prophet Musa والسلام, received his revelation at the age of 40. And so did Rasulullah receive the Holy Quran in the year 610, being born 570, would make it 40 years also. 40 by 40. Alright? Okay. Now, we're looking at a cube-shaped building, which people make a circular around. So we have a square and a circle. The foundation of the creation of the whole universe. You understand? Mm -hmm. The tree is what's sitting where Kaaba is right now, where Shaitan tempted Hawa. So when Muslims go to Mecca to run around the tree and not be tempted by it, by running around it, bickering and doing tour to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make the 360 degree circle around the 360 degree square, which is the 360 degrees of information that comes from the galactic heavens and the 360 degrees of information that's here on the planet Earth through the scriptures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they kiss the black stone, black is the word here, because it's the remaining portion of the clay which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shaped the body of Adam 
in and Ephraim in the land of Puti, where the junction of the two Niles are in Sudan. And they kissed the, the black stone as a symbol of Adam, their mother and father. Now make note that Allah has draped the Kaaba in a certain color. What color? Black. The Kaaba in Mecca is draped in black cloth, which means it symbolizes a tent. Which tent does it symbolize? Psalms of Solomon tells us, I am black but comely, O you daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. In Islam today, the so-called Arab bears witness to his history that the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was of the tribe of Quraysh, who were from the Hashemi, who came out of Ishmael, Abraham, through their son, Kedar. And that Abraham and Ishmael are the ones who re-erected the Kaaba in Mecca around the spot where Hajar and Ishmael was. And Hajar, as we know, was a black Mizraimite or Egyptian. Okay, so therefore the descendants that were in Paran or Bathsheba, as well as what's called today Mecca Paran, were descendants from Ishmael who was the son of a Chaldean black man named Abraham and Hagar, who was an Egyptian black woman, daughter of Abhaptek, Ahmed. And we find that the Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, came out of their descendants, meaning that he was black. So the Kaaba is draped in the tents of Kedah. And Muslims, the whole world, go there and bear witness to the tents of Kedar in Mecca. White Arabs, red Arabs, green Arabs, purple, stock, juice, and plaid. Bear witness that Rasulullah's descendancy, which they refer to in the third chapter of the Holy Quran as Ali Imran, Allah has selected them above other people of the world. The Quran makes that statement, not me, that Allah took Imran's family and made them above other people. Yet Muslims persist on saying there is no race domination. Yet you read the Holy Quran, the third chapter, and Allah says he had chosen Ali, Imran's family, and Moses' family above other people. That is a form of racism or partial decisions. He makes mention of the tribe again by the name, by calling it, that he sends thousands of blessings and protections for the tribe of the Quraysh, which was the tribe changed their name from Hashemi, which were descendants of Kedar. So it's telling us in that section of the Quraysh that we are to do what? We are to worship at a specific place. Where is that place that Allah is talking about? Somebody tell me. up at the east is that, or the mosque. Where? I just got to screaming and yelling and trying to tell you where. <laughs> where did he tell us to pray? In the Surah Al Quraysh. Does anybody know? Open your Quran to the 106th chapter. Oh, <laughs> to say. This is a Meccan surah, and it was originally revealed as 95, presently it's 106. What does it say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What is that? Begin all things with the illustrious name of Allah, the Yielder, most merciful. A thousand of protections should go out to the Quraysh tribe. Their protections, thousands of them, as they rahla, mount their horses to go forth in the winter. Allah Ta'ala is summing in everybody's attention in this chapter to a specific tribe of people who resided in Arabia at a specific time who were known to travel in every direction in the world in the winter and the summer because the environment they were in did not have the provisions necessary for their sustenance. إلى 
في قريش الى فيهم رحلة الشفاء في الصيف بل يعبدوا رب هذا البيت is the word I'm trying to come to he tells them the house they were talking about was none other than the Kaaba the same house erected or re-erected by Abraham and Ismail which symbolizes the tribe of Kedar the black tents so Muslims was told in the Quran to face the Qibla in Mecca and Rasulullah was being told that if he does he'll know which are those so-called hypocrite Jews and hypocrite Christians as they refer to them now in translation was with him when he tells them that Allah has called them because many of them in Medina because of his power and domination joined up with him but they wasn't really with him they didn't really have faith in Allah and his apostle Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam they just said they were and he said we'll find out Muhammad who's with you when we tell them to face Mecca and not Jerusalem and many of the so-called Yahudi turned in the other direction. This is the section that you're reading. And it says, you people will be a bare witness of those who are with you. And Muhammad is going to be a bare witness of y'all because he's going to ask you to change the Qibla also. So he tells his followers who are originally based in Jerusalem, you change the Qibla with me. And now I watch the children of Israel to see if they change the Qibla with you. Your father? Yeah, I have a my question was though why did it say we shall surely turn you to a Qibla that you will like I don't understand that part because they said they're turning you back to the Qibla of Nabi Ibrahim okay. they should have all accepted it because the children of Israel took their Qibla from Solomon's temple you see but notice throughout the scripture Moses as well as Jesus keeps referring people back to our father Abraham if Muslims and so-called Jew and so-called Christians will get back to who the father of our deen is, Mullah Ibrahim al Hanifan, we wouldn't have all these conflicts. The conflicts came out when Abraham's two sons, Isaac, Ishaq, and Ismail, went in different directions. And then from Ishaq, we got Jacob, Yaakov, and Esau. And from Esau, we got the Edomite race, the red race. And from Jacob, we got the children of Israel. His name was changed to Israel, and his 12 sons and one daughter became known as the Israelites. They had no religion. They had no laws except the religion of Abraham and the laws of Abraham. But they fabricated their own laws and made up their own religion and named it after a place they resided in. Judea, the fourth son of Jacob, Judah, and they call themselves Jewish or Judaism. Some went back further and thought they were doing something a little heavier, and they called themselves because of an incident that Abraham made when he crossed the Tigris Euphrates Valley, and he called them Abra, meaning to cross over, or Ibri, and they call themselves, when translated, Hebrews. Still not a religion, <laughs> still not a culture, was an act. Now from that side, through the 12 tribes of Israel, we come all the way down to Solomon and David. And that's how they founded their Qibla. Meanwhile, in Abraham's house, Allah sent the angel to tell Hagar it was all right for her to leave the house of Abraham because Allah will hear that nation and will establish an everlasting covenant with them too. There will be 12 princes. And that was the Ishmaelites. So Ishmael had 12 sons and one daughter. And they became known as the Ishmaelites. And they did have a doctrine because they kept the religion of Abraham. And they lived in Mecca where the Kaaba was. And they followed the rituals of Hajj and circumcision and all of the practices that Abraham had established there. And that religion that they were practicing became known as the peaceful way. Why? Because Ishmael was known not to be a peaceful man and Allah tamed him. You are not peaceful people. You are rally, rough, violent, as the Bible refers to you as a wild ass of a man, Ishmaelite. But Islam can tame you if you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can tame you. It can stop the drugs, 
and the prostitution and the gang wars and all of the things that you love doing so much, Ishmael, out in the world committing all types of sins and fornications because you love doing it, Ishmael. Because the Bible back in Genesis said you are wild ass of a man. Israel was wild ass of children too, but what did they do? They blew their covenant. And the covenant was made with you because the Lord said, I will hear. That's why his name is Ismail from the word Sema'a to hear in Arabic. I will hear their call. And you've been calling for the old time religion and now it has come to you, Ishmael, and you must submit and be tamed and become peaceful and be Muslim. And that's why Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. He didn't say, bless are my disciples. He didn't say, bless are the Israelites. He was with the Israelites. He was with Romans who were converting over to his doctrine, trying to become his followers. And he said to them, I have a lot of things to say to you, St. John chapter 16. I have many things to say unto you, however you can't even bear them yet. So I'm going to send to you another comforter. The catch word is another comforter. You follow that? And the Christians, of course, had other comforters was the Holy Ghost, of which we know the Holy Ghost is not others or another's. They proceed straight from the thrones of heaven. Okay. But he pointed out in his quote, huh? let, let me get this point out. Okay. He pointed out in his quote that out of the seed of Israel, who he was with, he came for them. But he also told them, blessed are the peacemakers, but they shall, in the future tense, be called the children of Allah. And now Al-Islam comes after him by another comforter named Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and he just happens to call his people the peacemakers. <laughs> so the covenant would be with Abraham or the Quran second chapter, the 130th verse tells anybody who does not follow that religion makes a fool of himself, right? The same word is there that's in this quote you're asking me about. It says the fools will do this here. <laughs> so we got Muslims now who are calling oh, a fool, Jews who are fools, and Christians are fools. A fool is either by his own doing or he is being fooled by somebody. Most of the Muslims in America are being fooled by pale Arabs who know less about Islam and about who you are than you are. So now the point is if we get back to Abraham's religion, al Hanifan, the upright one, you follow that? Who found grace in the Lord's eyes from here to the end of the world, there wouldn't be no conflict about the Qibla. There wouldn't be no conflict about the religion because the religion established in them was El Islam, the peaceful way. Adam was a prophet, and that we shouldn't distinguish between uh, the any prophets, prophets, any prophets. prophets. Right. And I, I was just wondering, it, it speaks of Adam one minute in Genesis, then the next thing it speaks of Eve, then them in the garden, then it speaks of Cain and his generations. But it, I was just wondering where and when and what did Adam, if he prophet, you know, if he was a prophet, where and who was he uh, prophesizing to and is it meaning that he was a, a prophet and he would uh, he would manifest in another time uh, the point is this is very important and that is that when you speak concerning Adam Ibrahim uh, Ishaq Ismail and all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the Quran before the Quran the judgment between the children of Israel and the children of Ismail, as they call them, are different. See, this is what happened. When these other brothers say that Adam was not a prophet, they're basing it on Islamic standards of prophethood. You see? They're not basing it on the Torah. Okay? If you look for what a prophet is in the Injil, in 1 John, chapter 4 it tells you that a prophet is a spirit there you see throughout the books of Exodus 
in Jeremiah, a prophet is one like Elijah of the scriptures who had the ability to foretell the future. You follow that? If he yes. failed in telling the future, he was stoned to death. When the Quran came, إلى رسول الله محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام The meaning of a prophet changes. You see? Though the word did not change, Rasul or Nabi, and remember, when they use the word Nabi, it has two different meanings of the word. One meaning is one who foretells a future event. And another meaning is one who gives you news. So therefore, according to the language, there are two forms of a prophet. That which prophesies things to come, which the Quran says Muhammad didn't do, and that one which brings you Basharan, new revelations in Allah Ta'ala, which is what Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam did, brought the Quran from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You follow? So Adam was a prophet in so far as A, he was a spirit incarnate of Allah. He blew into him of his breath of life, Quran says, and he became a living soul. Alright? Shaped man that addressed the ground and put my spirit into him. So he had the spirit of Allah in him, for one, which would make it relate to John 1, 1, 1 through 4. Then, he is the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the names of everything. Adam was more than a prophet to humanity, he was a prophet to every creature. Because whatever he called them, that's what their names were. Yeah. You see? Yeah. He even named Hawa, Eve. Because when she was presented to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Torah, he said, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. See, Adam spoke throughout the scripture of Genesis very authoritative. You see what I'm saying? He spoke as a prophet, he spoke as a seer, he spoke as one who foretold events. You see? Because it was his sohuf, which of course they will get around to realizing it is his sohuf that foretold the whole story of Idris and him being cast out and about the fallen angels, which you do find, here's the point, about Lucifer falling from grace. When they speak about how the angels was cast down out of heaven, correct? Wow. Who recorded this? Okay, if you take Ephesians, let's for instance, Ephesians 6, 12. They speak about the devil being in power in this world and in higher places in this quote of the scriptures. Throughout the Bible, it will speak about how Lucifer fell from grace. Ezekiel, turn to Ezekiel 28, 13 through 14. And read it to me. Ezekiel? Yes, Ezekiel. Okay. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Allah. Now, wait a minute. This is a story about the devil being in the garden of Allah. This is before anybody else was recording anything. Go ahead, read it. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Allah. Every precious stone was thy covering, and sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Turn to Isaiah 14, 12. Okay. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. The point is again, that whoever, now, this is an incident about Shaitan before the creation of the earth. Correct? No. And we as Muslims know that Adam, as y'all call him, Adam and Shaitan was in conflict before he was cast out of the garden. 
Now, Shaitan has not written any of these books. These are written by the prophets of Allah. Where did they get this information from? Who was there to write this information for them? To pass this information of what took place in the garden down from bloodline to bloodline? What prophet was there or what person there? Him alone. So therefore, there is prophecies of Adam in the Old Testament where he foretells the events of Satan and his fall from grace and even how he wants to take over heaven. That's Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. They think about how he wants to take over heaven. Ezekiel, I told you already. So, yes, the prophet Adam was a prophet of Allah. It's just that they don't realize that there's different forms of a prophet. And the main thing Muslims are suffering from is they refuse to read the scriptures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Torah and Injil, and they don't realize how vulnerable they're making themselves for the elite uprising Christian and Jewish scholars who are going to take Muslims apart in the very near future because of their lack of knowledge about things that they talk about themselves out their own mouths. You follow? They make certain statements in Islam without any support. And the average Christian and or Jew, what he's going to say is, is the Quran the word of Allah? And your answer as a Muslim would be what? Ma'am. Yes. Yes. Is the hadith the word of Allah? La. Then they'll say, okay, so let's not use this in our argument. Let's use this Quran only. Okay? And then they'll start to ask questions about Islam that is going to leave the Muslims spellbound because they're not equipped to deal with them. Without using hadith of men, they're going to be stuck. I mean, so many simple questions like, was Rasulullah ordered to read the Torah. The average Sunni Muslim will say no. The Christian opened the Quran to 1094 and showed him where it tells Muhammad to read the Torah. Did Muhammad read, believe, and practice the Torah in India? The average Sunni Muslim Shia will say no. But if you open the Quran to the second chapter, the 285th verse, it will show you that he did. And so what they'll do is say, but the scriptures are tampered with and then they'll say that the Torah or the Injil is tampered with. And they'll say some of those who are Jews altered words from their places. Then the problem comes up with a lack of knowledge again on the part of us Muslims because we don't know what a Jew is. The other fools are going back to the 17th century when they first got to Germany and they're calling them the Jews and they're also wrong. And the other people are going back to the crusade in the 11th century when the word Jews first grafted out of the Greek language to, to duplicate the word Judaism. And they're wrong, you see. In the Holy Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the children of Israel or Ahl al-Kitab or Yahudi, he's talking about the two tribes, the ten sons of Israel and then Dan and Judah who went to the south. When he uses the word Yahudi in the Quran, he's talking about the fourth son of Yaqub, Judah, and how that part of the family broke away from the other ten sons who went to the north and became known as Israelites. The other ones who went to the north fell into captivity and were utterly destroyed. Daniel and some of Benjamin, very few, but Dan, some of Benjamin, and Judah went to the south. Judah went into Ethiopia and became the Falashians, and the tribe of Dan moved up to the north, became known as Danakula, lived at the borders of Ethiopia and migrated to Sudan, which they now call Dungala. They're Nubian people, the original ones, not our people who reside in the capital today of Khartoum, which is a combination of Syrians, Africans, we have uh, Arishians, everybody mixed in that area now. So when an average Arab is being questioned, about the scriptures being tampered with by so-called Jews. They're talking about Jews in a specific place. What place is it? It's the city of Medina, which was called Yathrib. It's a little bit uh, uh, north, eastward of Mecca, which was called Mecca for a reason. Not because of the Saudi Arabian dialect either, for another reason. <laughs> okay, now, 
those people were not the seed of Israel under the covenant of Abraham. Those tribes that were in Medina at the time of Rasulullah were people who had converted to Judaism. They were not the descendants of Judah and they were not the house of Israel because Israel had already been destroyed. You understand? Whenever Allah speaks about Ben Israel in the Quran, He speaks about them in the past tense. But the children of Israel had a covenant and they broke it and you have no concern with them. If they doubt the authenticity of the, of the evacuation of the children of Israel according to the Quran, chapter 2, 214 of the Holy Quran, tells a Muslim that he cannot enter into the garden of Allah until what befalls him, the likeness of what befell those people which were before him, talking about Israel. So in this sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the children of Israel as something that has passed and that the new nation of Ummah would come from Rasulullah and they were supposed to make a repentance and accept this kalima. But of course, most of them didn't as usual. You follow? So in Medina, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there was no pure blood Israelite. They had already perished, the ten sons, and the other ones were down in Ethiopia. And the nearest they got to Israelites was Bilal, who was of the tribe of Danakal, and migrated out of Habashia over into Saudi, and became known as Hunafa, because they believed in Tawheed before Rasulullah was born. And when Rasulullah sent his first migration because of the family of Bilal, he sent them straight to Ethiopia first. That's the first place he sent them because he knew that there was tribes of Judah there that was expecting his coming. That the scepter of the house of Israel should pass into the house of Ishmael. As him being the prophet that Musa told about in the books of Deuteronomy chapter 18, 18. That that prophet from amongst the brothers of Israel would come. He knew this. And the man who brought the Kalima with the name being manifest as Muhammad was none other than Bilal, who was of the house of Israel, who was saying, Allahu Ahad, before Muhammad publicly announced, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, while his followers were still confined and holding the declaration of Tawheed in their hearts and private, Bilal was, and his followers were out saying, Allah is one, and besides him there is no partner, you see. They were Hunafa, they were Judah, who had come to Arabia looking for the seal of the Prophet Muhammad. They knew he was to be born there. They say it in the Quran, Ahmed, who you find mentioned in your Torah. So who is that talking to? It ain't talking to Muslims. <laughs> it says, Ahmed, who you find mentioned in the Torah, is talking to people who read the Torah. Trying to tell them that this Ahmed was someone destined to come. So the point is, when Muslims in this present day, they don't, they're, they're setting themselves up for destruction because they're not studying the scriptures thoroughly. When they say that the Bible has been altered in the time of Muhammad, they're talking about a group of people who had converted to Judaism and they had altered their scriptures to keep people from recognizing the presence of the seal of the Prophet Muhammad. You follow what I'm saying? Now the point is, in Pakistan today, Pakistan is considered an Islamic country, as is not. However, the president has not submitted enough to change that P to a B. There's no P in Arabic. It would be Pakistan. They still maintain Urdu, the Jinnah cap, and many other statements like Perdar, which is a P for the veil, and things that are customary. Now, if some sect of Muslims, maybe Ahmadiyya or whatever, bring up in Pakistan and they alter the Quran to suit their interpretation of it, correct? Would it mean that all the Qurans in the world are te altered? No, because the stronghold for Deen al-Islam or Deen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not Pakistan, it's Makkah. I'd like to say greeting in the name of His Majesty Emperor Ali Salasi Jaya Safara to all of my brothers and sisters and all disciples of Allah. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, my brother. Uh, my question to you is, do you believe that there are prophets in the world today? No, I believe the last prophet based on Islamic law, right, because let me make myself clear, 
If you go by the Webster's Dictionary of a Prophet, and then you go by the uh, Hebrew of a Prophet, and the Arabic of a Prophet, they come out to be different things. In the Webster's Dictionary of the, of the in English, Dr. Martin Luther King could be a prophet. If you go to the Holy Scriptures and read the language of the Scriptures, Dr. Martin Luther King can't be a prophet. So the last prophet according to the Scriptures was the prophet Muhammad. That was the last prophet according to the Scriptures from Adam's descendancy. Many men will come after that who are enlightened men who will teach reformers, guides, and different things like that. But the last prophet is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the seal of the prophet. But I believe there's many men in the world today who are intelligent, though. Yes. So I'd like to ask you: Can you tell me, from your point of view, what is a prophet? Well, my point of view don't mean nothing. My don't. <laughs> my point of view means nothing. According to the scripture, the word prophet in Arabic is Nebi. The word prophet in Hebrew is Nebat. They both mean the same thing. A person who brings a new scripture, a new holy book. That's what it means. Not one that reads the Quran or one that reads the revelations and teaches from Jesus' book or teaches from Muhammad's book, but someone that will bring a new book, a news bearer, bring a new book of revelation. That's what the word prophet means. Now there's disciples, right? This, okay, uh, now... Let's uh, understand, when Jesus spoke of disciples, he used two different things. One is apostles, and the other is disciples. The word disciple is the word tilmidun, and it means a young student. The word apostle is the word rasella, and it means somebody sent into to carry out a prophet's mission. So the difference between a student and a one sent to carry out a prophet's mission and a prophet sent with that mission, they're three different things. However, a prophet can be a Rasul because he could be after Moses and be sent to teach Moses' teaching and bring his own doctrine like Jesus did. That can make him both a prophet and an apostle. But he cannot be his own disciple. A disciple is just a student. It's just the word in the scriptures. The word for disciple is tilmiz. Right? And it means a young student. Jesus called, while he was with them, he called them his students. When he left, he called them apostles because they were, after he was gone, he said, I'm going to send you into the world. But they are not prophets. So a prophet would be somebody judging like yourself, right? I'm not a prophet. No, no, no. The last prophet is a prophet. A prophet was, is a man who brings a new scripture. That's what a prophet is. Yeah. And what he's done is he sent with these prophets, he sent holy scriptures. And these scriptures, as you read, like the book of Revelation, takes you all the way to the end of the world. If he intended to send more prophets after that, he wouldn't have allowed the book to take you to the end of the world. He would have only allowed it to take you to a certain point and then let the other prophets come and take you the rest of the way. The fact that the Holy Quran and the book of Revelation takes you to the end of the world tells you that he had no intentions of any other prophet coming after that. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. But, all right, so now disciples of, okay, disciples is someone who wants to follow a belief. That's right, he follows a certain teacher. That's right. All right, so you can say, so a certain teacher would be, would be called a prophet then, would you say? No, say you. You, when you came on, you mentioned um, Hala Selassie, correct? Yes. yes. His Majesty, Hala Selassie. You are one of his followers. Yes. That makes you his disciple. You understand? Yes. That okay. doesn't make him a prophet, that just makes you his disciple. Well, we don't follow Hala Selassie, we follow the God Jah. Yeah, I just, well, when you used his name, sometimes, some brothers I met who are rascals, and rather than rascals, they're rascals, they tend to make Jah and Hala Selassie the same thing. They may not mean to, but they do it by accident, the same way some Muslims have made the same mistake with Muhammad. They have Muslims worshiping Muhammad. It's just a normal mistake. So if I attribute that to you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to you. I just meant that I was trying to give a, a likeness. If a man follows Word D. Muhammad, and Word D. Muhammad is his teacher, he becomes Word D. Muhammad's disciple, his student. That doesn't make Word D. Muhammad a prophet. Because where D. Muhammad could have been a student of someone who's a student of someone who was the prophet. You follow? Just because you're 
being taught by a learned man, it doesn't mean he's a prophet. He could be a Molana, he could be a chef, a mullah. There are many different titles we have for learned men that doesn't make them prophets. ربنا أدمن لنا نورنا وأكبر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير. This is from the 66th surah of the Holy Quran, the eighth verse. And read, O sustain and complete for us our life, and forgive us, for surely you have the power over all things. 